Here's the 91 Porsche, fourth place for Fred Makoviki. Chasing down the 93 car, Earl Bamber back at the wheel of the US entered car. That's the white car with the Brumos tribute livery. A great view there of that exit curb. Actually, when we were watching uh, the Ferrari from above, Alessandro Pierre Guidi had a wheel inside the exit curb, and then as he came off the corner, it came back over the ragged edge, the inside edge, which is not a smooth transition off the tarmac. And it's constantly doing that that runs the risk of puncturing tyres. We've seen a lot of inside shoulder punctures where the car comes in slowly and you go, no, no, all the tyres are fine. But when it comes off the car, there's nothing left of the inside shoulder. Six hours to go at Le Mans. We're three quarters of the way through the 2019 season finale. And Toyota Gazoo Racing 1-2 and LMP2 ahead of SMP, who are up to third after another problem for the number three rebellion. G-Drive, Senior Tech Alpine, Jackie Chan Racing, TDS, Duquesne, and United battling for supremacy at the front of the LMP2 field. And 17 of their 20 starters are still running nose to tail. In the GT Pro class, currently Corvette, slightly ahead by less than 10 seconds from Ferrari, Porsche's third and fourth, and then the gap back to the Fords. In the AM class, Keating Motorsports still with the lead, as they have had for most of the night. Project One's Porsche in second, JMW's Ferrari in third position. And the last running car is Johnny Adam in the 97 Aston Martin in 50th, 47 laps behind the leader. And how many laps behind? He's 15 laps behind the class leader. And from there on down, both Dragon Speed cars are now out. Jackie Chan's lost a car. SMP have lost a car. Baikoles and ALC Bratislava are out of the race. AF Corsa have lost a car. AMR have lost an AM and a pro car. Uh, Aston Martin Racing have not had a good time here. Corvette have lost one of their two cars. Dempsey Proton lost one of their two AM class cars. It's been a race of attrition for many. All done and dusted at IDEX Sport. Everything back in its position, including Lego Man. Good to see. Might need that banana a little bit later. Yeah. Speaking of breakfast, Jamie Campbell Walter in the back of the booth has got the kettle on the go again. Drip feeding the tea. Here are our four class leaders, Mike Conway for Toyota Gazoo Racing, Roman Rusinov for G-Drive, Mike Rockenfeller for Corvette Racing, Jerome Blokemet in the right. That Dutch guy for Keating Motorsports. Blickemolen. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Jeroen Blickemolen. Just uh, catching up, by the way, with the G-Drive situation with the Michelin versus the Dunlop, and Jot van Oetert, who was in the car before handing over to Roman Rusinov, saying, the difference seems to be that the Michelin switches on immediately when you leave the pits. Hey Mike, what do you think for the next two stints? Continue on, on soft low temp or going on soft high temp? I mean, it's not so okay. I mean, what's the other car doing? Are they quicker on the other side? No, they are not quicker. They are not quicker. At the moment, they are slower than us on average. They are slower than us on average. One minute thirty-eight. One minute thirty-eight. Okay, uh, let's keep the tire then. It's okay, we keep it. So we can put a new set of soft low temp, no problem. Yeah, discussion there, soft low temperature or soft high temperature, which is yeah. very relevant to the discussion you had about the Dunlop and the Michelins in LMP2. And it's the working range, they're both the soft compound, but it's the working range that they go up to. And the soft low temperature is, uh, we see Sally Yollock spinning off in a replay at uh, Dunlop Schein, just a very small spin. It's actually 19 degrees, but that tire will probably go to about 23, 25 degrees on soft low. And the temperature now at whatever it is, 9 o'clock in the morning, track temperature down to 18.9. That's the lowest it's been all race. Middle of the night, it was still 20. It's continued to drop as the heat goes out of the track. The air temperature is just bottoming out and is starting to come back up. It's now nearly 16 degrees again. But we've got a lot of cloud cover, so the sun isn't starting. Even the early morning sun isn't starting to have its effect on the tarmac. And in the end, you know, Alan, if it ain't break, don't fix it. If you're still going quicker, stick with what you know. Yeah, but the other thing is that they know the other car, uh, the 8, is on the soft, hot tyre. 
And so from that point of view, they are pulling away. They are a little bit quicker in general. And uh, so therefore, it's quite a consistent situation for Mike Conway, and he's going to get a new set as well. The other, the other factor, going back to Dunlop versus Michelin in LMP2, not only does it take two or three laps for the Dunlop to come in, out of the pit lane, but that's also, it seems, at least another lap that they lose that performance for behind every safety car. Once they go back up to speed again, the Michelin switches on immediately. But what Yop, Yop was saying about the Dunlop is that in terms of pace, it's absolutely, he feels, on a par with what the Michelin offers throughout the stint. So it takes a, a, a little while to get it there. You have to bludgeon it a bit to get it up to temperature whereas the Michelin seems to be a little bit more responsive in that pocket. But as it is, we've got an even spread. We've got three Dunlop and three Michelin cars in the top six. And there's no way of telling which time manufacturer is going to have their caps on the winners on the podium in six hours' time. Now, that's not the case in the GTE Pro class. That's pretty much going to be people in blue caps because Michelin supply the tyres to all the cars in that class. There's no tyre wall there, but there is every other kind of battle going on. Top four cars of GT Pro all matching each other with a 351 last time around, so they're all absolutely equal at the moment. They, of course, are overall there with just, without sponsors badges on, but rows and rows of Velcro, so they can be applied and, and, and changed depending on which championship the mechanic is working in on any particular weekend. It's a very sensible bit of thinking. Well, no tyre battle in the GTE Pro class, but four manufacturers battling for supremacy. Round goes the Rebellion, number one car. Number three car with a white background to the splodges. Number one car with a black background to the splodges. That's Andre Lotterer, currently in fifth position. Last time round, 330.1. Last time round for teammate Nat Berton, 325.9. Leaders are doing 322s, and that includes Stoffel van Dorn in third place for SMP Racing. In fact, he was quicker than both Toyotas uh, last time round. Fourth place, Jonathan Bomarito in the six, fifth place, sorry, 67 Ford. Going down, he's got an SMP behind him, but that's also Sebastian Bourdais. And this is a battle between uh, the British run car by Multimatics and uh, the Chip Ganassi racing run car from the US. Let's get down to AF Corsa. We saw him out of the car looking hot and bothered a few minutes ago. Duncan Vincent is with the man who handed over the lead car in GTE, Daniel Serra. Yeah, Daniel, you look very cool now. You did look very hot and sweaty when you stepped out of the car, but have you had a good debrief with your engineers? Yeah, like, um, it's really tight. It's lap one, everybody really close, so let's see what happens till the end. Uh, I think we have a good car to fight until, until the last lap, so we will do our best. Yeah, there's about, what, 20 seconds covering the top four. This is a five-hour sprint race. Do you have to change your mindset, or is it just full-on attack? Like, it's a 24-hour race, but it seems like a sprint race. A full attack, six lap one, we are pushing, we are doing our best. Uh, it's really close, uh, and let's see. I hope we can do it. Do you have enough good tyres left to finish the race? Uh, to be honest, I don't know, but uh, I hope so. <laughs> OK, thank you. Good luck. Okay. Thank you. And what a difference a year makes, Alan. Remember speaking with Pierre Guidi last year? Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing this place. It can be the most beautiful track in the world, and it can be the most cruel mistress as well. And Daniel Serra, son of a racing father. His father, Chico Serra, raced in Formula One. And uh, slightly more prosaically, Alan Manish reckons he was the 1977 British Formula Ford champion. Possibly not chief among the things that he remembers in his career. Well, I do, because I remember going to Alton Park with my dad for a gentleman called David Leslie, yep. who my dad was mechanicking for him, and it was Trevor Van Ruen and Chico Serra were the two guys he was fighting with. And I just, all I remember is this name, Chico Serra, and I thought, Christ, he must be fast. He's got yep. a fast name. Well, certainly he was fast, and... Uh, and the winner the year before, when they, in fact there were two British Formula 3 championships, he was preceded as champion by Nelson Piquet of that parish, and also Derek Warwick 
Stefan Johansson. Now, I haven't seen him here this week. I'm not sure if Stefan is here this weekend. He often is. He won the championship the year after uh, Chico Serra. So when they were all young lads, you've got to grab the rest while you can when you're a mechanic here at Le Mans. We talked about this all the way through. While the drivers can go away safe in the knowledge that if it's not their turn, whatever else happens, they will get a little bit of rest, maybe two stints worth, which is worth maybe an hour, just to shut their eyes. The mechanics never do because the cars are in around about every half an hour. And the reason that the LMP cars, particularly the LMP1 cars, are in more frequently than they used to be, I mean, they used to do 50-minute stints. Now they're doing barely 35-minute stints because they're using less fuel because more of their power comes from electric energy recuperated through the hybrid system. And so the fuel tanks are smaller, and so they need to be filled more often. Now then, this is not good news for our leaders. Why was the door open so long for Roman Rusinov? It looked as though they were looking Golly. at the steering. He's going into the garage. This is the race leaders in LMP2. Has he got a dodgy electrical system? Lights go on and off. All right. That's extremely bad news, potentially, for G-Drive. Don't forget, although their car is called an Aurus, you can see the badge on the nose, that's the Russian state limousine manufacturer. It is, in fact, an Orica built by Ugg de Schonach, and so is the Alpine, although that's badged differently to an Orica chassis. The third car on the road is also an Orica, so is the fourth car. The best Ligier is in fifth. Well, these two were expecting to be pitting on the same lap, so it's no surprise to see Pierre Thierrier bringing the 36 car down to the senior tech team. Well, it's gearbox related, I think. Looks like uh, something with the gear shift because they're in at, yep. the, at the actuator at the back and Absolutely. also in the front at the steering. And what happened to the 38 Jackie Chan, 37 Jackie Chan DC racing car? That had a gear selector issue as well that ruled them out. They had a long time in the pits and they never managed to get it cured. So again, you be careful here of schadenfreude or whatever the French version is. Do not glory or delight in somebody else's misfortune when you're wearing the same pair of shoes. Yeah, but I've got to say, his, his lap times were not slow, Roman Rusinov. His in-lap was uh, still very quick, as now Pierre Thierry goes back out in the Signatelic Alpine. He is effectively three minutes behind. So uh, if uh, this car is in the pits, and it looks like an auto reset if you look at the steering yeah. wheel there. So, so yeah. he came in, and the car was normal, switched it off, fueled up, switched it on. That's... I mean, uh, and then suddenly he's, he's not being able to get a gear. This is the battle for fifth position Ooh. in uh, GTE Pro as Sebastian Bourdais goes down the inside of Jonathan Bomarito and the Rebellion tries to Whoa. squeeze its way in as well. That was a little bit brave by the Rebellion trying to mix itself up in at that late stage, but now Bourdais is up into fifth position. Yeah, so he is the best of the Fords now, the uh, uh, Le Mans-based driver. And yeah, the Rebellion driver, that was the... Uh, number three car of Nat Berton, or it wasn't actually, it was number one car driven by Andre Lotter. He saw that that saloon door was closing in a hurry. Number eight is down and done. Kazuki Nakajima heads back out on track. No, he doesn't. He's handed over to Sebastian Buemi, the helmet tells us. So do the eyes. So Buemi in the number eight car, continuing the chase. Last year's winners for Toyota Gazoo Racing. You notice that he hasn't got his uh, drinks plugged in. No. He's decided not to have a drink. Obviously, he's had enough tea swilling around inside him, and they're still, still going through the setup menu. Have you tried turning it off and on again, sir? Yeah, dropped, actually, I have. And actually dropped into second place overall now. And so the steering wheel on and off. Oh, my goodness, this is for them. There's an element of cautious optimism in the Signatec Alpine pit. Well, at the moment, I think that was just, again, when you're exhausted, you know, high fives on a pit stop well executed with five hours, 45 minutes to go. They'll do another maybe seven or eight of those. Cooling everything down as well. Now trying to get air into the systems at the back. Well, everything starts up OK. There's no 
blue screen of death or bouncy beach ball, but doesn't appear to be doing very much, does it? I would suggest by the fact they're still sitting in the pits here that uh, it may not be on the screen. Well, this offers another sliver to Jackie Chan DC Racing and to TDS. Hope in turn you're looking at there, he's in third and he is catching Roman Rusnov. Oh. But they've got a couple of laps, a big lockup from the Cesar Villa, but no, it's not a lockup, is it? Yeah, that was a lockup, was and just... uh, that was just a huge lockup, but I think it was from the rear tire. Yeah. And uh, he was lucky to pull it out of the, the speed he went across the apex. He was lucky to get it out of the, gra or not go into the gravel trap. Yeah. But I uh, would think the G-Drive are going to drop down another position very soon with Hope in Tongue coming down towards Indianapolis and frantic round about the back of the, round the back of the G-Drive car. The G-Drive car has now dropped onto the same lap as the third and fourth player. Yep. No, he hasn't. He's eight minutes still I behind. Don't think, I don't think that's Maybe completely not. correct, to be but honest with you. That'll reset it's, itself it's at the, the line. It's with the pit stops. Yeah. So here we've got uh, the Jackie Chan DC Racing, which we saw coming in with a left front puncture about one hour ago, very, very slowly. Its sister car went out with a gearbox problem in the middle of the night, and uh, we kind of considered it was going to be dropping off the leaderboard, but looks like its opportunity for maybe jumping back up into second is here. But again, the sister car has struck gearbox problems and retired, and now one of their close rivals in the same chassis, basically, has struck gearbox problems and retired, we, so... We don't know if it's gearbox at the moment. Suggested no. it could be, but uh, yeah. right now we're not sure it is gearbox. It tends to be not the mechanical bits that go. There is the 37 car, in fact, parked up and um, freshly polished, it looks like. Jackie Chan DC Racing return in season eight of World Endurance Championship with the 37 car. The 38 car will be back as well, also run by Jota Sport, who are running the two cars this year, but it'll be under the Jota Sport banner for the first time, rather than yep. as a Jackie Chan DC Racing car. Now, Hopin Tung is up to second. Chase is on, he's a lap behind the Senior Tech Alpine car that leads and that means TDS will also come through in 15 seconds or so to move up to third ahead of G-Drive. Yeah, the two leader lights just behind the number 38 on the side. Two blue leader lights there. It says second place. And Loic Duval is going to be in the next 10 seconds crossing the line going into third place. That will push Roman Rus Rusinov down to fourth. Villalba Course car comes in. Not sure if it was on its way into the pit lane anyway. They didn't change tyres though, despite this pretty impressive lockup. Yikes. Crikey, it was a long lockup. He's going to be able to have a bit of vibration, I would have said. As the seven comes in, Mike Conway, we heard earlier on a uh, discussion about tyre choice and him deciding to stay on the soft, cold, that's a cold temperature working range, soft compound tyre. He was getting a new set of that on. He's got uh, quite a bit of a gap over the sister card. It was about one minute and 40 seconds prior to this stop. So full service, fuel and tyres for the race leader. And should the two Toyotas finish in the order in which they are, in the positions in which they are, some part of not winning the championship may be assuaged for the crew of the number seven car by being the winners at the Le Mans 24 hours. If you were forced to make a choice, Alan, which would you go for? Winning Le Mans or being a world champion? If it was your only chance to do either? Le Mans. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I know, it's hard. It's a hard thing to say, isn't it? But you're still going to have that replica trophy. You're still going to have that watch. No, you don't get the replica. You get the trophy. You, you get don't the get real, a replica. Yeah, you a get real the real trophy. thing. What, the vast one? No, the vast one's for the manufacturer, yeah. and then the, if you win it three times on consecutive years, you get to keep it as well. Yeah. Well, to, or to, Toyota might get to do that. Should they win here, they'll return next year with the TSO 5 -0. So there's the potential of that as well. Earl Bamber, outright winner at Le Mans. Sebastian Bourdais just set the fastest lap time in the uh, Ford, currently in P5, 350.5 just done a 350.7 as well so he's he's pretty rapid at the moment driver swap before
the Kessel Racing Ferrari. Manuela Gosner getting out, and I think that was Rahel Frey who is about to take over. Rahel there in the centre of your shot. She had a good junior single-seater career, raced in DTM as well, and now becoming quite the, the sport sports car expo. I shouldn't have started that sentence, should I? That didn't work. She's good. Yeah, she is. Good, uh, I know Rahel very well cars. because she's... Uh, driven for Audi for many years yeah. and I know that gentleman as well Stefan Artelli yeah you and him have a bit of history here don't you yeah we've got a bit of history in a few places yeah. actually with Steph yeah but none of them compare to winning here and standing on the top step of the podium with him uh, we've won here in uh, 98 and we finished second here in 2000 and uh, We've celebrated it a few times since then as well. <laughs> Any excuse. APM Monaco, Monaco Porsche leads, leaves the pit lane. Steph and I, uh, we celebrated being alive uh, in uh, Monza 2008. We were in <laughs> next door hospital beds. Yes. I had uh, five broken vertebrae and he had a broken ankle after his crash at the first chicane, yeah. whereas mine was at the second. And we both high-fived each other, although he had to hobble to me because I couldn't move. Did, uh, did you ask a nurse to go over to that chap next door and high-five him for me yeah. and bring his high-five yeah. back? <laughs> We're alive. none of us can move. <laughs> yeah. G-Drive, well, still alive, but a little on life support. They've now dropped to fourth position with this electronic issue. And there are far fewer worker bees on the car and the driver is still in, so they're now starting to set two in the grubby bits at the back. Did, did I not just hear Duncan whisper in our ear that it was the alternator? No, he said, where is the alternator on these things? Ah. Like, uh, hang on a minute, let me just get my owner's handbook out from under the desk. Oh, starter motor. It's illogical if it is a starter motor um, because it was at the restart. But normally there's two things here, there's cooling it, and also there's a little bit of a tap of the hammer. Yep. Yeah. Many years ago, I had a Triumph Herald convertible with a dodgy starter motor, and you had, used to have, the Triumph Herald, the whole front end of the car came up, you used to have to lift it up, and I had a long wooden stick, and you tap the starter motor down past the alternator, and that would free it, and then it would always start. My sister then inherited that, and she used to drive to school. Her, her friends thought she was some kind of mechanical genius. She'd get in the car, click, nothing, up with the bonnet, hit it with the stick, close the bonnet, boom! They were just absolutely awe, awestruck that she knew how to fix a car that wouldn't work. So, yeah, possibly hit it with a hammer. Well, Duncan, you have a bit of uh, past history in the pit lane with a similar sort of situation, right? Oh, you remember two years ago, Rebellion had the same thing, and they used to come in and they'd hit it, they cut a hole in the bodywork, and they did not then have covered the hole up with the bodywork with a bit of tape in yeah. Park Fermi, and that didn't go down too well. Yeah, that's no. correct. Exactly right. Yeah, well they remembered. Went, they had forgotten about that. I remember the hole in the bodywork. I couldn't remember why they had cut a hole in the bodywork, uh, but uh, that exactly got them into a little bit of trouble. But it was a case of, uh, you know, what do they do to actually try and make sure they still stayed in the fight? And that was the quickest way, because they had to do it at every stop, if I remember correctly. And uh, that was ultimately their undoing. And it looks like it is also G-Drive's undoing. The car now is down to fifth place. And uh, it's now down three laps on the leading Signatech Alpine. Pierre Thierry at the wheel, Jackie Chan DC Racing is chasing it. Then you've got Lloyd Duval now, Ducuni Engineering with Reg is in uh, fourth, fifth United Autosport, Phil Hansen, G Drive in sixth, soon to be seventh with IDEC overtaking as well. Well, Jim Roller, you come at all the opportune times when there's something new going on. <laughs> I think you're the man that's sort of dictating this race, are you not? Mm, uh, I don't know. So what's new? Besides, there is now a bacon shortage in France. <laughs> Jim's had breakfast, and uh, what's new is that at the moment, the G-Drive guys don't yeah, have any time yeah. for breakfast uh, because they've been out front and leading for quite a long time, got a bit of reliability problems. They're up Sebastian. to their elbows in alternators. Well, they're up to their elbows motor. in something. Uh, we've had Rebellion going off into the gravel, which I'm not oh. sure if you saw. That was uh, Gustavo Menezes lost it in his chase for Stoffel van Dorn in the SMP. Mm. Stoffel still in the car in third place. And uh, he went off in the left-hander 
in the middle of Porsche curves, got uh, beached and came back into the pits. No real problem apart from the fact he's dropped now away from Van Dorn in that chase for third position. After that, the other thing that's happened is that uh, we've had a bit of a chase with uh, Sebastian Bourdais, mm. winding things up in the Ford and overtaking uh, the sister Ford, the Bomberito, who has now got back past him with the pit stops again. But it looks like, uh, in terms of strategy, that right now the Corvettes are looking pretty good. All four Fords back in contention, uh, fifth, fifth to eighth in class. Uh, three cars, three different manufacturers still at the front of the pro field, the Corvette followed by the Ferrari and then the Porsche. And here comes that rebellion into the pits. That's the number three car. Nathaniel Berthon behind the wheel. Boy, if there was a spirit of the race, I think it would have to go to these rebellion guys. Um, absolutely. Hopefully Just keep event. pressing on. Just keep pressing on. Brake change, is that? Yep, yeah. brake this change for the number 93. That's pretty late change. That's They've done pretty well. Well, they, breaks. they did the front. The last time I was ah, in the booth, yeah. they did the front. So uh, the rears are obviously not. You try to make the rears last, but mm. when the pad gets quite thin with the curb usage around here, you tend to get a lot of knockoff. So I think for the sprint finish, they're obviously going to give the drivers uh, the best possible car. Gosh, can you imagine that? 24 hours around this place, and it will be a sprint finish, and it will be. Hope so. It will be was last few years. Yeah, sure is. And it's setting up to be that again now. Yeah, currently only eight seconds the difference after 18 and a half hours of racing. We have eight seconds between the Corvette and the Ferrari. Oh, that was close. You couldn't have put a piece of paper between those two cars. That's the number 92 Porsche, our uh, world championship leaders coming into this race. That right now, as it sits, would uh, win the championship. But if Johnny Bruni and company can win the race with that car in 12th position, then they would be world champions. And I didn't get the number of that uh, prototype that went whistling by. And boy, you couldn't uh, you couldn't put put a piece of paper between them. This is the moment now. The last five and a half hours, a, a, a normal FIA WEC race, uh, just under to go. Mm -hmm. But the difference is, and we see a lot of action in there those races. Right like there. The, yeah, there we go. Um, hoping Tung was it, cutting it pretty fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we see a. A lot of action in a in a wet race uh, with six hour race and these guys though they've been going for 18 and a half mm. hours and this is the moment when the sun now is up uh, the track is is rubbered in but offline very dirty and the drivers and the mechanics and the engineers are all very tired very now. tired this is when this is when the fatigue mistakes might start to happen. Let's check in with Duncan Vincent. What's going on down at G Drive, my friend? Well, it's getting built back up. The wire to the starter motor, meanwhile, the starter motor was broken. Sheared it needs to get repaired, put back together. Strange thing is going to break, but you know it's Le Mans. If something's going to break, it will break. So that car has come back out of the garage, now onto the pit straight checking that all the tires are indeed seated and off he goes. So we'll see what we've got. We've got a one minute 47 gap between first and second. Mike Conway, Sebastian Buemi. Uh, Mike has done two fantastic stints, both uh, in the averages uh, in the 22s. Kazuki Nakajima, who's uh, just got out the car, though, uh, in the mid-23. So still uh, that sort of one second difference between the cars. Uh, I saw a tweet earlier on from Fernando Alonso mentioning something about a door uh, having a slight gap in it. 
creating drag, uh, which is maybe an explanation to their straight line speed. Um, it's not the number eight uh, day, is it? They've no, just it been certainly slightly isn't. off the pace. I don't think it's the drivers. I think it is genuinely uh, just something to do with with the car that has meant that they've been uh, slightly off the pace. Uh, but five and a half hours to go, one minute 47 between them. Anything can happen. One mm. little clip with a back marker uh, whilst lapping or a little mistake from a tired driver, everything can change. Obviously, with the way it stands now, uh, the number eight car would be the champions. Yeah. And it would be, uh, possibly that would be the best scenario because number seven could celebrate the victory and number eight could celebrate the championship. Yes. So I'm sure the number eight guys don't feel that way, but maybe uh, maybe the factory does. The 26 G drive back out onto the racetrack. Roman Rusinov behind the wheel, 20 minutes, 36 seconds, and they've lost five laps to the class leader, the Signatech Alpine of Pierre Thuré. And and then the Jackie Chan yeah. Ho Ping Tung in the number 38 car. And then Luke Duval in the number 28 TDS. Top three in the class. Those cars all separated by a lap. So that battle has uh, Mitch, has, has has gone away. Yeah, Michelin leading that uh, tire mm -hmm. war battle against the Dunlop shot uh, Jackie Chan racing car. Uh, Stoffel van Dorn now aboard the SMP car, currently in P3 on an outlap. Uh, they are some four laps down. Again, you know, uh, a good solid podium place for SMP. Uh, they've got a two lap lead over the Rebellion car. Um, you never know, you know, trouble for the Toyotas. We've got a slow Rebellion. Oh, That's no. the number three car, not back up to speed. Oh, I'm sorry, the number one, not back up to speed after its pit stop on its outlap. Andre Lotterer at the wheel, uh, a three-time winner, and he seems to be... No, that is the three car. The three that car. is the three car. That's I talked myself on. right out of that. He gets, he speeds up to about 120, and it doesn't go any further. No, nope. no, nope. he's in fourth gear. I wonder if he's stuck in gear. Oh, no, 147, 150. He's only got part throttle, though. He's not mm -hmm. trying to go any quicker. Some, ah, I see. Sometimes um, you can have things like a drive shaft fail mm -hmm. and only on one side. So you've still got drive. Ah. Uh, what happens, though, is that you don't want to damage the diff uh, because you've obviously only got one side working. And if, if you go too quick, too much throttle, you can do more damage. Um, so he might be nursing something like that. Uh, I don't know what it is, but something like that, which causes you to, to go slowly. Unfortunately, he's got a whole lap to do. Yeah, and there goes the one car on its out lap as it goes past the Jackie Chan number 38 car. Mechanics all looking on. They will be discussing it over the radio, no doubt, uh, to get an idea of what's wrong with the car. Again, this team has been snake bit since Thursday. They had a good performance on Wednesday. Thursday, they lost both engines in two different sessions, one in the early session, one in the second session of the day. That's a replay. Yeah, it doesn't really give us anything. Super slow-mo of a slow-moving slow car. Again, that, that telemetry really told us a lot because uh, yeah, there he goes. He now he says, well, at least he's, yeah, he's not, he's not stuck throttle. in fourth, so I was no. obviously wrong about that. Oh, what's that? That is clutch. Like, it could be uh -huh. brake fluid or clutch fluid. Uh, they're pretty similar. So he could have a slipping clutch. Mm -hmm. That's another option, which is, again, uh, you would avoid going on full throttle because you don't want to overheat the clutch. It might just need a bleed. Okay. But to be honest, we, we don't really use the clutch apart from when we're in the pit bank. So the only reason he would be doing that is because the actual clutch is slipping. Yeah. And uh, so much of this is fly by wire now. You don't yeah. really have, uh, you know, it's a, you don't have a clutch pedal to, to drop. Mm. 
still the, the, the phenomenal thing for me because the conditions have really stayed quite good throughout the race that Mike Conway still set the fastest lap of the race, 317.2 on lap four. And I think everybody else has settled in. I think, yeah. I think if there was a bigger challenge at the front that you might see some times being posted, but I think the eight car has, has got just enough of, a, of, of issues, nothing, nothing major, nothing that's gonna make the car drop out, but they can't get the ultimate speed that the seven car hasn't been forced to go any faster. And you only want to go as fast as you need to to win the race. So Alan Prost style. Yeah, exactly. Just right. do enough to win the race. That's exactly right. The G drive, which was uh, comfortably out in front at one point, now finds itself in a battle for seventh place with the number 23 uh, Panos, Panos Bartes competition car. Will Stevens behind the wheel of that car with the golden arches there on the front, the number 23 car. Then comes the G drive distinctive in its gold bronze paint scheme. Here comes the number three chugging into the pit lane. Now under its pit lane speed limiter, less than five and a half hours to go. If they're gonna make any sort of challenge at all for the podium, this needs to be uh, not a major problem. If it is, then SMP can kind of cruise to the podium. car comes to a stop in its pit box. So they'll put fuel in the car. He's overshot his uh, pit stop there. They just had to pull him back. Uh, trolley dolly's ready to go, fueled up. They'll drop the car now, wheel it around. You can only have four guys on the car. Come on, boys, give it a push. There it goes. And now they'll get to work. Someone's graffitied their garage, look. <laughs> it's been that way all week. <laughs> As a checking, uh, yeah, it's might be brake fluid. First thing he did was check the brake cylinders yeah. there. Yep. So those little uh, plastic bottles at the front of the chassis there, that, that houses the fluid for the front rear brakes and also the clutch. Back out on the racetrack. The number 26 car, working traffic. Goes past the 97 and the BMW. He's only 2.8 seconds behind Will Stevens there in the uh, Panas Barthes competition car. It's a broken uh, headlamp cover. They might change that. That's quite yep. a draggy yeah. area. If you have a hole in that area there, the air goes into that little pod which houses the lights and it probably loses you two or three kilometers yeah. an hour in a straight line. So yeah. they'll definitely change that if they get a chance. Not to mention possibly cause more uh, damage within yeah. the pod. And now this is going to give the uh, number one car an opportunity to get back on the lead lap. And in fact, is going to take the position. He yeah. got back on the lead lap before. Yeah. So Andre Lauterer now goes into fourth position. Three laps behind the SMP racing number 11 with Stoffel Van Dorn behind the wheel. Andre Lauterer, of course, a winner with Audi. And the famous Truth in 24-2. That was a good program, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I remember... Yes, it was. Um, if you listen carefully, you might hear somebody, you know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Jason Statham, wasn't it? I resemble that remark. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was number one, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes, yes. It always rains at Le Mans. 310 kilometers, 315 into Indianapolis, 320. 320. 270 at the apex. 270 kilometers an hour. It's a phenomenal speed through there. Out of Indianapolis, here's the big break into Arnage. First gear, one of the slowest corners on the circuit. And off he goes, up to around 8,000 revs in this car. The Gibson technology engine. Uh, fantastically reliable engine this this is now, uh, which is across the LMP2 grid. How, uh, what did you say, 320 going in there? 320, yeah. 
Let's not 198 forget. miles an hour in old money. Yeah. Fastest speed so far for an LMP2 car is actually 331 kilometers an hour. Wow, that's over 200 miles. Per Remember, hour. that's at the speed trap, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. So actually, they go a little bit faster because the speed trap is always just a few hundred meters just before the breaking point. So probably saying 332, 333. Uh, which is, I think, 200 miles an hour, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yep, yep, yep. Um, exactly what that is. For an LMP2 car, I mean, it's... Yeah, a, really? A, a <laughs> insane speed. Will On a public Steve road. Yeah, <laughs> with a crown in it. Yeah. <laughs> Will Stevens comes into the pits with the number 23 car. One of the Ligiers. Crew goes to work. That means he'll give up the position to Rusinov, Roman Rusinov, in the number... 26 G drive. So that car moves back up to seventh. Black and white flag for Cooper McNeil in the number 62 car for abusing track limits. So once more, and he'll have a penalty. Didn't, yep, didn't just uh, exceed them, he thrashed them apparently. <laughs> Sebastian Buemi cutting his way through traffic, 323.1. Goes by the fourth place car in the LMP2 category. That's the number 30 Duquesne Engineering entry. The IDEC uh, Sport, Paul-Luc Chatin, Chatin in, uh, is currently in sixth place, has just set the fastest lap of the race, a 328.9. Some some people are still pushing on, yep. trying to uh, make use of the last five hours remaining. Fastest lap for that car. There you see some of the bodywork kind of wiggling, hitting the bumps. On board with your race leader, Mike Conway, the man who has really kind of dominated the story the entire week with qualifying efforts and then, of course, those fast laps at the beginning of the race where he kind of grabbed this race by the throat and his team has been able to hang on to it ever since. Through karting corner, fantastic fifth gear corner. Off camber, very difficult. Here we are approaching a Ferrari. He'll lift off, use this. What they do here is when they know they're gonna get some traffic, they lift off earlier mm -hmm. to regen uh, the ah, hybrid okay. system. And now he'll boost it out, and you can see, let's not forget, that's a Ferrari 458, ladies and gentlemen. It's a quick car, and the Toyota just blasts by it. Here comes your second place car in LMP2 out of the pits. That's the number 38 Jackie Chan entry. A little straight line moment, though, through mm -hmm. the second chicane. A mistake from Hopington. He's on his out lap, actually. Yeah, he is. So he could have... Gold tires, gold maybe? Gold tires. We were hearing that the Michelins were coming in much quicker than the Dunlops. Uh, the guy's obviously still struggling with the, with the... It's very easy to get the rears in because you've yeah. obviously got, like, 600 horsepower going through the rear <laughs> tires. So that, you know, they're just... The, you can the, light those up the, if you the need to. The energy going, going through them is, is quite high. The fronts are the, are the difficult aspect, um, and it creates a very understeery car at first and you don't want to overstress that tire either because the pressures are slightly lower you've got to build them up try not to lock them up into the first second chicane and into Mulsanne corner by the time he's starting to get to sort of Indianapolis uh, they're, they're getting there and then by the time he's gone through the Porsche curves that's where the real energy is put into the tire um, here he comes through the bank corner there's yeah, sure race leader, the number 36, and you see the provisional points as they are standing right now, and that team would win the team championship for Signatech Alpine. See, what's happened to the TF Sport car? It was when I left, it was in the top three. It's now languishing down in 13th oh. place. I think it went in the gravel, didn't it? You I think, think so, had a, yeah. 
lost a few laps in the gravel. Such a shame for Aston. Uh, I rough tweet, week. Rough week. Rough week. Uh, I tweeted about it. I mean, the only glory they can take from the weekend is uh, is a uh, pole position, uh, which, as we know, there's no points for pole position. Uh, yeah. Actually, there is one. Oh, one point. Okay. Pole position. Um, <laughs> but uh, really sad to see. I mean, they're yeah. dead last of all the cars running the, the 97 car that's still going. And TF Sport down in, in 13. I think they would have given up the point and taken no VOP. Yes. Jerome Bleakenmolen in the AM leading Keating Motorsports number 85 with that beautiful wins livery. The first of uh, first time we see Ford in the hands of a privateer. There you see the 84 JMW Motorsports third in the category. Oh, we Lou behind the wheel, and here's your second place car in. GTE Am, that's the Project One Porsche. Jörg Bergmeister, longtime factory pilot behind the wheel of that car. Of course, Project Team Team Project One is the, the winningest Porsche team in history, given their performance in Porsche Cup and Super Cup and uh, single make races around uh, Europe. Meanwhile, here's the 93, fourth place car, Earl Bamber. He's a lap down to the top three. Top three in the pro class. Alessandro Perguidi in the A, of course, in number 51. Antonio Garcia in the Corvette, 10, uh, a minute and one second behind. Then uh, Jimmy Bruni, who I think is on the tail end of that lead lap. Uh, he's only 28 seconds behind. Slightly out of sync they yeah, are. Um, exactly. Pierre Guidi is about to pit because uh, he's on lap 13 uh -huh. okay. or 14. Um, whereas um, Antonio Garcia, Bruni and Bamba uh, are all laps three, four and five of their stint. So we should see uh, uh, the competition between them close up mm -hmm. any second, uh, I think in a lap or two. Pace-wise, Pierre Guidi is being mighty at the moment 51.3 average uh, wow, over for the his, stint for the stint wow. over 13 laps uh, Antonio is uh, after four laps on a 51.6 so some three tenths slower uh, Bruni on the other hand after six laps is 52.8 a full one and a half seconds slower than Pierre Guidi so it seems the the race is coming to the Ferrari slightly yeah a little bit uh, Bamba on also on a 52.9 so very Bruni the two Porsches uh, p3 and p4 very similar pace uh, Antonio in the Corvette slightly quicker but uh, the Ferrari is uh, looking very quick was really during the days of the Audi Peugeot battles that we really started to pay attention to the stint times. Everybody used to be so focused on individual lap times and we discovered that it was the overall stint time that really uh, proved to be the difference in some of those battles. So now uh, people pay much more attention to the to the entire stint and what the driver can average for that stint per lap. Yeah, uh, that's been like that for, for many years actually. Yeah. Uh, when you get, uh, well, probably from the commentary booth we all used to talk about the fastest lap yeah, because exactly. that's what people want and actually the the young drivers when they say how oh, how did you compare with your team oh i was two tenths quicker than yeah. him and he's only talking about the we fastest lap that yeah. he did and actually you used to get the reports uh, from your engineers after the race and they would have in a little box at the top fastest lap of each driver mm -hmm. but the most of the page was made up of okay. your average stint, stint. time and they collectively add all those average stints throughout the whole race. Mm -hmm. So every st single stint you did, and that was the big number at the bottom. Ah. How long did it take you across your 10 stints to go from A to B? And it would be, you know, eight hours and two seconds for Jamie Campbell to, to go however many kilometers, and it would then you would get your teammates. Wow. And that was the number that actually the team bosses wanted to look that at. That was the proof in the pudding, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's, that's the important one. A uh, report from uh, the, the pits and Louise Beckett was the DF Sport. Aston Martin now down in 13th position in the AM category took a little trip into the gravel and that's what caused that car to drop down the order.
Yep, the uh, rebellion came in uh, a while ago. Um, was running very slowly for a lap. They've changed the front nose. Yep, Look, that's they, nice they, and clean. They changed the front nose. Uh, they were looking when the front car first came in, Louise. They were looking uh, at the fluids, brake fluid, transmission fluid. So we're not sure uh, exactly what they changed because we quit seeing pictures. New but, tires. Yep, new tires. Yeah, Louise wouldn't wouldn't mind knowing what was uh, what was up with that car. Yeah, as soon as the car uh, departs and everybody can take a breath, why Louise will wait in there and Off he goes. pose the tough questions. So he's now some three laps behind his teammate Andre yep. Lotterer, who we also saw going slowly uh, not so long ago. Mm -hmm. 14 minutes, 14 and a half minutes on that pit stop. So there you go. Pierre Guidi has also stopped in the lead, mm. class leading Ferrari. He's now dropped down a place behind the, Ferra uh, the Corvette of Antonio Garcia, and the gap is five seconds. That's advantage Ferrari at this point. At this point. We we're not sure if, uh, if he's put new tires on or not. Probably not because he was on his first stint. And so he's probably double stinting these tires. Bit of damage there to the. Uh, uh, looks like almost like rubber build. Yeah, though. lot of lot of pickup now in yeah. this this last five hours. Yeah, uh, and, and you can see some some of these shots. How much slag, for back of lack of a better term, is off line. Yeah. And you get off in that stuff, and you you pretty much knackered your tires. It, well, it's also like ice. It's literally yes. you go on it, and it is, uh, and it's really difficult to get rid of when you go slightly wide. If you if you're lucky enough not to go in the gravel because of it, because it is literally like the car just stops turning. Uh, but what happens is that that cold rubber that's sitting mm -hmm. on little balls, we call it marbles, mm -hmm. uh, on the track. Obviously, you got the you hot tire. See it there, yes. at drivers left. All those A lot little black it. dots. Those are the marbles. And uh, when it gets onto your tire because you go through it, uh, it adds about uh, two centimeters to your tire diameter. <laughs> and uh, it takes, take, it's easy to get it off the rears, but it's the front of the problem again. And it's really difficult to get off. And it can take one, two laps before yeah. you get rid of it. Plus your teeth, plus you lose a couple of fillings. Oh, your yeah, teeth. No, the vibrations. <laughs> it, oh, you almost feel like there's something wrong with the car. Yeah. But, you know, you quickly cotton on while I, I was an idiot. I went off wide. <laughs> so it's my own fault. Take, take my medicine. Yeah. There comes the uh, Toyota back out onto the racetrack, the number eight car. Sebastian Buemi stays in the car. Top four cars in pro. So after we've all had the pit stops, 40, 39 seconds separates them. Corvette, Ferrari, Porsche, Porsche. And a battle on the racetrack for fifth place. The Duquesne Engineering. Pierre Rags and Jatan in the number 48 car. Did one of them just dive in the pits? Yes. Okay. So yes, that's uh, that's Rags in the uh, uh, and the uh, Jatan came to the pits in the I deck number 48. Yeah. They were. He was only five tenths of a second behind, but had to make the pit stop. So that'll separate that battle, unfortunately. Nicolas Lapierre has come in and back out in the leading number 36, Signatech Alpine. Looks like fuel only for the 48. Romain Dumas driving a car with an internal combustion engine for the first time in a while. <laughs> And setting all kinds of records with the electric Volkswagen. Uh, Pierre Turret in the uh, leading car before Lapierre got in. Um, averages were sort of uh, you know, up and down between 33 and 35. Hopington, on the other hand, has been pretty consistent in the mid 32s. And uh, Loke, Loke Duval uh, is mighty in 30.8 uh, average. 
Let's check in with Louise, who can uh, give us an update on just what was going on with the rebellion number three. Yeah, I've just spoken to Kaleem, and uh, he was saying after the three-minute uh, penalty they got for the wrong tyre, as I understand it, it was the wrong serial number given to the officials on the tyres. Yeah, it was a clerical error. Yeah, I mean, just, yeah, yeah, precisely. Three so minutes they got three minutes. Gustavo was obviously pushing to try and make up that time. He went into the gravel. He's caused a problem with the brakes, and that's what they've been in fixing. So the gravel got up into the brakes. Thanks, Louise. Good work, as always. So Our intrepid uh, pit reporters, Louise Beckett and Duncan Vincent, doing uh, stellar work down there in the pits, all alone covering that long pit lane. That's... Uh, That's a piece of uh, one of the United Auto Sports cars. Here he comes. And here he comes. And now that 32. is either not oh, been yeah. put on properly. Oh no, he's got all kinds of, uh, but all kinds he of damage here and on the other side as well. Well no, the whole thing's, I think that's not been put on. The wind's got under uh, it's okay, a sure. gap and yep. it's ripped the whole thing off because I don't see any damage. Other, Ten, other than damage nine, that you would expect eight. to see. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Full course yellow, full course yellow. Yep. So full course yellow now. Yeah, we just saw a replay. Uh, I think they've had a stop, um, put the rear deck on, or uh, one of the clips is broken or something, yep. and the wind has literally just ripped the rear deck off. Ripped the rear deck right off, and uh, with it, other damage, so. They'll be replacing some bodywork, just checking everything over to see uh, if the, uh, they have to put new clips on, see just what the situation is. There comes the uh, one of the Orange Army. They'll use this full course yellow as a little opportunity to have a clean up, put the floppies back in. Bet that ends up in a man cave someplace. Yeah. Yeah, here comes the replacement rear deck. This car, obviously, the Ligier. We've got uh, Orica's... 35 Ligier. seconds to go green. Ligier's, uh, 35 seconds until we're green. The... Uh, Quick top up here for the seven under the uh, full course yellow. 25 seconds to go green. That's an interesting... Uh, 20 seconds to go green. Uh, Mike was on his 11th lap. 15 seconds. He had to, he had to come yeah. in. That's emergency service. Ten, He'll be back in nine, again because he only took eight, about seven, five seconds worth of fuel. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Green track is back to green. Thank you, gentlemen. So uh, what's happened there is, yeah, he was at the end of the stint. He was coming in uh, for fuel, and uh, they've only been able to put five seconds in. A little uh, swings and roundabouts comes a little bit of an advantage now yeah. to the number eight car. We'll see if they can parlay that into closing the gap at all. Problem is, is this number seven car is still about a second and a half a lap quicker. He'll probably, uh, hopefully he'll take it easy on this lap. Doesn't look like it. <laughs> 300 kilometers an hour coming uh, out of Tete Rouge. He'll hit uh, almost just shy. There he goes, 200 miles an hour. Boy. 300 board, 200 lifts off, and now breaks at the 100. About 120 kilometers an hour through the chicane. Full gas up through the gears. Hybrid operation up until about fifth gear. This is the second of the, the straights on the Mulsanne. Of course, used to be one long straight, and now three shorter straights, but we still see pretty high speeds. So lift off, you see, and break. So they lift off for about 150 to 200 meters, and they're regenerating the battery of the hybrid. And there he's using that hybrid power. You can see the, the gauge on the left, HYB, as that goes down a little bit. Yeah. We use it for about uh, 150 meters, 200 meters, just to boost it up to 300. And then hard on the brakes for the Mulsanne corner. You can see Mike's uh, drinks bottle here on the left-hand yep. side with his little straw into his mouth, and he can have a little sip of water when he feels a bit thirsty, and then 
You're just below when it comes out the helmet, you can't quite see it. There's a dry break there, which is what they ah, push okay. a button and it just uh, disconnects the, the the helmet from the, the water bottle. I noticed earlier Sebastian Buemi didn't have his water bottle in. He's obviously had many cups of tea overnight. <laughs> 325 kilometers per hour at the entrance to Indianapolis.